The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to this session in which we'll start our studies of literature, main four, form four, and Wawela Arnold Malfo, your literature and English teacher. So to start, we are going to present the program that you'll be studying in form four. Now, this program is subdivided into modules. The first one being the storyline, or the plot. There's also characters, which has to do with you know, true to life representations of humans in different texts. The third module that you'll be studying in this class is background and situation or context issues. And more specifically, we'll be examining things like the setting and the atmosphere. Also, you're going to study social issues and other concerns in different texts, otherwise called themes. Lastly, you study style and then stagecraft and creativity issues. Now, as far as the first module is concerned, that's the storyline or the plot, what are some of the sub-issues that you would explore in Form 4 as part of your literature and English studies? First, you want to be able to provide details of the way different stories develop in terms of the plot. You also have to classify plots into main plots and subplots and establish the relationships and functions between these different plots in a particular story. It would also be useful in this module to see how events in the story can be predicted and to create some causality, to create causality and to explain how the cause and effect principle operates in the different texts. You would also have to provide summaries of scenes, acts, you know, and even whole plays where applicable. In terms of the second module, just to do characterization, you will be charged with providing physical and moral descriptions of characters, of the personages who feature in the different texts. You will also have to compare and contrast these characters, be able to express your opinions about situations which are depicted in stories, about people who are depicted in stories. And you will also have to be able to locate character within the context of a play. Besides all of this, you will be tasked with classifying characters. Who are heroes? Who are villains? Who are clowns? Who are fools? Depending, of course, on the particular type of text that you're studying. At this level also, you will be necessary that you notice what appears to be a playwright's comments and also the contribution that particular characters play as far as the development of the particular text is concerned. In this module, in this module also, we start looking at things like coincidence, fate, the inevitable, and providence. As far as the third module goes, of course, the third module being background and situational or context issues, you will explore the time and place, the atmosphere and the mood, and you'll be able to create a connection and explain how these issues influence the characters, influence the plot, influence the development of specific types of atmospheres within the either novel or play or the poem. As far as social issues and other concerns go, you would be able to identify main and minor themes. You would also be tasked with explaining how these themes tie a work together, how those themes constitute the exposition of a writer's position. 
In addition to that, you will be able to distinguish between explicit meaning and implicit meaning in a text. Also, we are going to explore the main and the peripheral thoughts which playwrights, novelists, and poets express in their literature. You would also have to be able to react to the content of these literary works and provide your opinions on the different conflicts that uh, are depicted therein. In terms of style, first, you will explore essential discourse markers in the different texts on the story. You will be charged with exploring how these writers use figurative language technique, uh, narrative techniques, different points of view. In fact, the whole armory that constitutes the how of how a particular literary piece is put together, that is going to be the substance of this particular module entitled Star. And lastly, as far as stagecraft and creativity issues go, the name obviously implies that this will apply specifically or more frequently as far as drama is concerned. And just like in the previous module, you would explore the entire ensemble of how plays are put together, from the use of dramatic techniques to the use of staging techniques and stage directions and all of those different elements that come together to make a play a play. So all of those issues are going to be explored in this last module entitled Stagecraft and Creativity Issues. So what texts then have been prescribed for study? As far as prose goes, you have two novels, the first being The Crown of Thorns by Linus Assam, and the second being Lord of the Flies by William Bowling. As far as drama is concerned, you study Macbeth by William Shakespeare. And lastly, as far as poetry goes, you will be given 18 poems selected from modern anthology of poetry, which is edited by Hans Bokwe Itori. So then, having uh, presented that program, we are going to start, and the first step to start with is the crown of thorns. But obviously, we won't just start analyzing the text immediately. Instead, we are going to focus on prose types, and specifically, we'll be looking at narrative texts and narrative techniques as a precursor to our eventual study of the Crown of Thorns by Linus Assam. Therefore, the focus of this session is prose types. How would this specific lesson then be developed? We're going to lay out our objectives. We'll look at some concepts and issues with which you're already familiar. And then we'll examine the prose types themselves. When we've done all of this, we'll summarize what we've done, evaluate ourselves, and then have something to do after the session. What then do we want to achieve in this session? First, we want to list some prose types. We also want to list and then define some narrative techniques. And lastly, we want to outline the features of different prose types. These are the three objectives that we want to attain by the end of this session. In order for us to do that, we assume that you're already familiar with basic literary genres. You know what prose is, drama, poetry. You're familiar with it because you've been studying it from form one to form three. You're also familiar with some basic oral storytelling techniques because you've studied this, and you are familiar as well with the forms of oral literature, having studied these, especially in forms one and two. So it is based on this that we then proceed with our examination of prose types. But for us to do that, let's consider the following questions. First, what are the main genres of literature? And secondly, can we state two characteristics that distinguish each genre? So notice that in terms of what the main genres of literature are, obviously there are poetry, drama, and prose. Those are the main genres of literature. Now, what are two characteristics that distinguish each genre? Of course, there are many. There are many distinctive features of these different genres. And of course, there are some features that cut across. As far as poetry is concerned, we notice that in the use of stanzas, that's, that's a pretty distinctive feature, which we will not see in prose and in drama. Also, there's an amount of word economy. In other words, there's brevity in the use of 
language. So many ideas are put in a few words. The ideas are loaded such that the reader has to unpack the meaning from this use of words. As far as drama is concerned, obviously the most distinctive feature of drama is dialogue because the plot develops mainly through dialogue. Also, there is action. Remember, drama is a story that is told in action. Prose, of course, is not told in action. Poetry can be dramatized, yes, but it is not basically told in action. Drama, in its nature, is told in action. So that is a pretty distinctive feature of drama. As far as prose is concerned, of course, there's the use of regular sentence patterns. We read a novel, of course, the sentence patterns are pretty regular, unlike in some cases in poetry where there's a lot of inversion. There's also extensive narration that marks prose. So having looked at all of those, then let's focus on prose. What is prose? Prose, first of all, refers to what we call normal language, everyday language. When you speak, that's prose. When you read a newspaper, that's prose. When you pick up a textbook, maybe your classroom notes, all of that is prose. So it is just straightforward speech. And of course, the etymology of the word, which goes back to Latin, indicates that prose is just straightforward or direct speech. And for that reason, therefore, there's a natural flow of speech, and even of the grammatical structure. You see regular sentence patterns. But now, when you pick up a novel to read, we say, yes, prose is just regular speech. But when you pick up a novel to read, is the language that you see really regular? In some cases, it's not. So that leads us to the idea of prose types. Because although we're talking about regular use of language, there are still some distinctions. And these distinctions, therefore, lead us to the idea of prose types. The first being non-fictional prose. The second being fictional. We have heroic prose. And we also have poetic prose. And of course, the names in some cases are self-explanatory because if prose is not fictional, it means it is historical. It is based on stuff that actually happens or actually happened. All right. Fictional prose. First, has to do with prose as works of art. Generally, when people talk about prose, they talk about prose that talking specifically about fictional prose. Oh, hey, hey, well, studying, uh, this is a prose text. The person who says that is most often thinking of a novel or a novella or a short story. So there's that assumption that prose and fictional prose are synonymous. But of course, we're, distinct, we're creating a distinction here and saying that prose is a more general concept. And when we talk of novels and novellas and things like that, we are in fact talking more specifically about fictional prose, about prose as a work of art. And of course, that is what we're going to be concerned with as far as your literature and English program is concerned. And as we're going to explain later, Fictional prose has some specific features, it has some specific elements, including character, plot, setting, etc. We'll explore those later. So, uh, we can also think of fictional prose as narrative prose, because fictional prose basically is prose that tells a story. So, you realize that it's mostly narrative. And that narration unfolds in the sense that a an action or a series of actions you know, are all described and those actions come together to develop a story. So when the story is told, this narrative prose, when that story is told, it's mainly for entertainment and for instruction, like almost all of literature. It's told for entertainment and for instruction. And as far as this program is concerned, like we said, we're going to be studying the Crown of Thorns and the uh, Lord of the Flies. So these constitute narrative prose. They are fiction, it's fictional prose and also narrative prose. And that is what we're going to be studying in this program. What then are the elements of a narrative? What are those different elements that come together to make up what we'll be talking about, what we'll be calling fictional prose? What are those elements? First, plot, setting, then characterization, style, and themes. These elements come together to make up what it is that we call a narrative. We'll explore them one after the other. Starting with plot. Now, in a very straightforward manner, the plot is simply the sequence of events, or of major events that make up a story. The sequence of major events. What does this mean? When we talk about a sequence, it means 
One thing happens and then another happens. But again, uh, these things are not haphazard. There is, they, they operate on a principle of causality. It means that event A happens, and because event A has happened, event B happens. For example, a person wakes up from bed in the morning, having had a bad night, and so he or she is in a bad mood. Because he or she is in a bad mood, you know, he refuses to give pocket allowance and even transport fare, so his son or daughter is supposed to go to school. That son or daughter becomes annoyed as a result of that. And when that child's pet, which is normally very fond of, comes, you know, for some cuddling, he kicks the pet instead, it's a dog. The dog becomes furious, and when the dog sees uh, a chicken passing by, he snaps at that chicken. So, you see that th those, that's, that's a sequence of events, but they are not haphazard. There's a principle of causality that links them. So that is basically how the plot of the story is developed. And we've also noticed that in uh, more elaborate narratives like novels and, no and novellas, there are major plots and then there are subplots. That's as far as plot goes. And uh, at this level, of course, Form 4, you know, you're already preparing for the GCE, you are going to need to recall what it is that happens. Because you'll be asked to recall and even recount sequences of events that happen in the different texts on the study. So you need to be able to recall what happened and explain what happened happens. That's as far as plot goes. Setting, on the other hand, has to do with the circumstances in which these events that make up the plot take place. Because things can't happen nowhere. They must happen somewhere. So, if they're happening somewhere, that really takes us to the idea of a place. It means setting has to do first with where? The geographical location in which these events take place. And these geographical locations can be general or specific. If you're talking about a country, either named or unnamed, in Africa, in Europe, in South America, that is a place. That's a general geographical setting. They have more specific geographical settings. If you're talking about Yaoundé, you're talking about um, uh, uh, Mora, you're talking about Bamenda, or you're talking more specifically even about a particular house in a particular bedroom, in a particular living room, at the football pitch, those are all set in terms of place. Setting also, you know, stretches beyond just the place in which these events take place, and even gets to do with the time. When do these things happen? And the time is very important because the time in which a specific thing happens can influence our understanding and our interpretation of that thing. Obviously, the story is set, for example, in the, in the mid dark ages or the Middle Ages. And then another one is set in the 21st century. You realize that if you read a story which is supposedly set in the Dark Ages, and then you see one of the characters uh, posting on Facebook, that all of a sudden would help you in your evaluation of that story because you'll be able to see clearly that that story is not true to life. It doesn't reflect the realities of the Dark Ages. So you can have setting, then general setting in terms of time, and you can have more specific setting. Since we're in Africa, if we talk about uh, pre-colonial era, for example, that is when it happened, before colonialism. Colonial literature, post-colonial literature, pre-independence, post-independence. So those are general times, periods, in which these events take place. I can have more specific times, morning, evening, etc. So in terms of characterization then, characters are imagined real people who take part in the story. They are imagined. Why are they imagined? Because this is fiction. We are talking about you know, fictional prose. And in fictional prose, the characters have not existed before. They may be modeled on people who have lived, but they are not exact representations of those people. And in most cases, even that puff in the figments of the writer's imagination. But why do we say that they are real? They are imagined in the sense that they, they haven't existed for real, but they behave like normal people would do, and they are judged based on the expectations of how normal people would behave. Therefore, they are real in that sense. And that leads us to the principle of verisimilitude. 
That's what that's what we mentioned earlier that if you read a story that is set in the Middle Ages and you see people posting on Facebook, obviously that is not true to life. Because from history, we know that in the Middle Ages, the technology just didn't exist. So you can't have a character posting on Facebook in a story that is set, say, in, in, in 1500. That just doesn't work. It is not true to life. It doesn't follow that principle of verisimility. So there are several ways you can know about you know, a character, whether a character is is you know kind, is wicked, etc. You look at what the character does, what the character says, what the author says about that character, what other characters say about the character, etc. Themes, on the other hand, are just major ideas that are developed in a story. And they may be main themes which form the core of what the author wants to talk about, while they may also be minor themes, just peripheral themes that emerge as the story develops. In terms of style, style embeds the how of a narrative. A story has been told. How has it been told? How? And this will lead us automatically to the idea of narrative techniques and even of literary devices, not figurative devices and stuff like that. So the first thing we want to talk about, of course there are many, but we want to talk about a few, is point of view. When a story is told, that story must be told by somebody. So from what angle does the person tell the story? Does the person say, I went uh, to San Melima and I saw and we saw? If the person is saying I and we, it means the person was part of the story. The person took part. It's, it's an eyewitness account that the person is giving. So that would be the first person point of view. The person is telling it as someone who took part in that story. And of course, the advantage of this is that it makes you believe the story, but at the same time, if you are taking part in the story, it means you cannot know the thoughts of another character. So he has an advantage and has a limitation. If on the other hand, the person telling the story is just some narrator, some either named or unnamed narrator, who has so much information. Because the narrator seems to be omniscient in some cases, to know everything that happens, even in the character's minds, to know what the character's plan. In that case, you hear the narrator saying, he, he got up, she went, they decided, he felt that he had been cheated. So you see that this operation is in the third person point of view. And of course, there may be third person limited or third person omniscient. What about contrast? Some writers place certain aspects in the, in the text side by side so that the reader can notice differences between them. And doing so may balance the narrative and it may also contribute to keeping the reader interested in these pieces that may run parallel and then maybe join at the climax. So contrast, just presenting things side by side so that the reader can notice the marked differences between them. Suspense, on the other hand, is that technique through which an author creates some anxiety, some excitement in the reader as the reader anticipates the potential outcomes of events. With the epistolary device, Documents are used within a text. Documents, mostly letters. You hear the name epistolary. Epistolary, of course, comes from episode, and an episode is a letter. If you're familiar with, you know, biblical study, you know, the epistles of Saint Paul, or the letters of Saint Paul. So, the use of documents and more specifically of letters within a text, within a, a narrative, within fictional prose, and of course, using this, this the uh, Documents would serve specific purposes. They may be pointers into a character's thinking. They may be explanations for a character's motivation for doing what he or she does, etc. Of course, you'll be left on you as the reader to determine the specific reasons for which these different narrative techniques are used. It's also foreshadowing. If something is foreshadowed, it means it is yet to happen, yet we get some sort of indication that it would happen. So foreshadowing can take so many different forms. It can be through symbolism, it can be through what the character says, etc. But basically with foreshadowing, the author creates a situation or gives a hint that helps the reader guess at what would happen later in the story. Flashback, on the other hand, basically takes the reader to some event that had happened prior to the present. So flashback helps to explain the motivations of, for characters doing what they're doing, 
It helps to present some kind of background information that underpins some of the events that the reader has already been exposed to, etc. So again, in addition to these narrative techniques, writers spice what it is that they write using figurative language. And of course, why it is true that figurative language uh, is probably most significant in poetry, it, its use is not limited to poetry only. We're talking about the basic things. We talk about similes, you know, indirect comparisons, similes. We talk about direct comparisons, metaphors. We talk about metonymies. We're talking about all the the entire gamut of figurative devices can also be used in prose. All right, what is it that we have seen in this session? First, this is of course after having presented a program, we've identified four main prose types being non-fictional, fictional, heroic, and poetic. And of course, our interest was mainly on fictional prose, because that's what we're going to be studying. Uh, what are the elements that we've seen as being constitutive of fictional prose? We've talked of plot, we've talked of characterization, we've talked of setting, we've talked of theme, and we've talked of style. Let's then evaluate ourselves by considering the following questions. First, which of the following is not a distinctive feature of prose? Which of the following is not a distinctive feature of, of a distinctive feature of prose? Is it A, word economy? B, regular sentence patterns? C, narration? Or D, A and B? So let's just... Uh, examine them for a moment, one after the other. A says word economy. And of course, word economy suggests the use of few words to communicate many messages. But what did we say process? What did we say in novel is? It's a significant narrative. It uses regular sentence patterns. It is elaborate. So can those features coexist with word economy? You see, that, that simply doesn't work. On the other hand, regular sentence patterns are used. Narration is used in prose. So what does A and uh, what does D say? D says A and B. So realize that although regular sentence patterns are in fact a distinctive feature of prose, the inclusion of A under option D eliminates that option. That leaves us then with the answer being A, word economy. That is not a distinctive feature of prose. Two. A character whose thoughts, feelings, and behaviors change as he or she has different experiences may be described as so they are affected by what happens to them. Are this A, static characters, B, flat characters, C, round characters, or D, interesting characters? So, obviously, characters who change, who evolve, are round characters. They are not static. They are not flat. Three, it denotes the totality of techniques and devices used in a narrative. The totality of techniques and devices used in a narrative. What, what do we call that? Is it A, plot? B, style? C, setting? Or D, characterization? Of course, this takes us back to the elements that constitute narratives. So what do we, did you say plot has to do with the how? No, products to do with what actually happens, the sequence of events. Style. Let's keep style aside for a moment. What about setting? Setting has to do with where the story takes place and when it takes place. Characterization has to do with those imaginary people who take part in the story. So we realize that we'll talk of the totality of techniques and devices in the narrative that leads us to the concept of style. Lastly, then, four. Persons in a fictional work are judged according to the expectations and principles of the real world. The above statement is, is it A, totally false, B, true, C, simply not true, or D, it's, uh, well, kind of true. 
That person's in the fictional work are judged according to the expectations and principles of the real world. If you remember, we talked about the principle of verisimilitude. And it's that principle that led us to say that uh, characters are imaginary, but they are real. So in fact, it is true that persons in the fictional world are judged according to the expectations and principles of the real world. Having looked at that, therefore, let's have this as an assignment. One that we should find out and also write down the following about Linus Asso. His date of birth, his place of birth, and his profession. This is, of course, in preparation for our next session, which will be on background information on setting, author, plot, and the structure of the Crown of Thorns by Linus Asso. Una tege minga matege nyum, una tege majang matege ndom, mane tambia ninya ne injubia yen, ngani bana matege mut, ngani la kiri watege ndong, esa kina bia jinki do, mane tambia ninya ne injubia yen, tam tama mote tam zabike. Tam tama tonge tam zabike tam tam tama mote tam zabike mane tambiani